Hi everyone, and welcome to this CoPro Learning session on a brief history of co-production. In this video, we'll go back in time to examine co-production's origins and roots, how the practice grew, where time banking and credits come into it, and who the key figures were along the way. So, where did co-production come from? The seeds of co-production would be sown by academics such as Sherry Arnstein in 1969. Writing about citizen involvement in planning processes in the United States, Arnstein described a ladder of citizen participation that showed participation ranging from high to low. The ladder, broken down into three groups, citizen power, tokenism, and non-participation, is a guide to seeing who has power when important decisions are being made. This guide would prove to be an important framework from which co-production would evolve. For example, on the right here, you see an updated version of the ladder created by Think Local, Act Personal to include co-design and co-production. The term co-production itself was first defined in the late 1970s to early 1980s by economist Eleanor Ostrom. Studying neighborhood interactions in Chicago, Ostrom needed a word to convey what was missing when the police abandoned their close interactions they had with the public by walking in their neighborhoods and became more remote and distantly involved by patrolling in their cars. There was a contributing factor to successful policing that only members of the public could provide to make sure services worked. In Ostrom's view, the police had effectively detached themselves from the relationships they had developed with their community by literally putting a physical barrier between them and the people, and the informal intelligence that they exchanged when they walked the beat was essential in preventing and solving crimes. It was Ostrom's team who defined co-production as the process through which inputs used to produce a good or service are contributed by individuals who are not in the same organization. Around this time, the term co-production was also being used in a health context in the UK by Anna Coote and others at the Institute for Public Policy Research and the King's Fund to explain why doctors need patients as much as patients need doctors, and that when that relationship is forgotten, both sides fail. Co-production was then picked up in the 1990s, again in the US, by civil rights lawyer Edgar Kahn. Kahn was an influential member of Bobby Kennedy's team in the US government until one day he was suddenly taken seriously ill with a heart attack. He found himself unexpectedly transformed from being powerful to being powerless. Lying in his hospital bed, he felt disengaged from decisions being taken about his health. With doctors busily working on him, he felt that he had his power taken away from him. Regardless of how high functioning he had been in the real world, in the hospital he was just another patient, being done to, echoing the concepts articulated by Anna Coote and others at the Institute for Public Policy Research. Kahn further developed the principles of co-production in his book, No More Throwaway People, The Co-Production Imperative, by articulating the concept of the core economy. The core economy is made up of all the resources embedded in people's everyday lives, time, energy, wisdom, experience, knowledge and skills, and the interactions and relationships between them, raising children, looking out for neighbors, taking care of older people and caring for our environment. These are an invisible world of family and community where transactions take place that economists do not measure, where work takes place that the market does not value. Deemed worthless in the market economy, these interactions are essential to enable our communities to thrive. Edgar Kahn's premise is that every person can be an asset and that productivity must be redefined to include social as well as economic contributions. He developed time banking as a vehicle for leveraging the power of the core economy. One hour of time helping someone else equates to one time credit, which can be exchanged for an hour of someone else's time. He felt there was a need to redefine the relationship between the two economies. People being people is never quantified in monetary terms, and quantifying actions defeats the purpose. Time banking values what it means to be truly human, 
and to contribute to each other as people and taps into the community's knowledge about what is working and what's not working. This for me personally was the light bulb moment in my co-production journey, understanding that relationships need to be reciprocal for true change to happen. Sadly, Edgar passed away earlier this year, but he leaves behind a legacy that will continue to inspire us for years to come. Edgar Khan helped internationalize the idea of co-production with the spread of the core principles and promotion of cultural empowerment of citizens in Canada, New Zealand, Namibia, and the UK, where it is increasingly being put into practice in all areas of public service, from mental health to social care, from housing to community support. Many self-advocacy organizations, for example, dealing with community development, housing, and social care within the UK, have adopted co-production as a way of working. There's a natural alignment between self-advocacy and the co-production approach. Self-advocacy holds a values base around citizens' rights and skills around empowering people to make their voice heard, as well as the passion for challenging inequality and discrimination. Both co-production and self-advocacy are about enabling people to have a voice and to make choices about their support and their lives. Now let's consider more recent developments in the field of co-production in the UK. Since the turn of the millennium, public services in the UK had become constrained by centralized targets, deliverables, standards, and customer relationship management software, which narrowed the focus of many services and often undermined the relationships between professionals and patients, teachers and pupils, governments and citizens. The change in socioeconomic factors in the UK meant that these increasing pressures on public services to deliver more with less resources created a fertile environment for change and adoption of co-production. Organizations such as Nesta and the New Economics Foundation have been at the forefront of promoting and encouraging the adoption of co-production in relation to public services. Their work explains clearly what co-production is and what it's not. They include a range of telling examples of co-production at work and convincingly present the key benefits of co-production of service delivery. David Boyle observed in his 2009 discussion paper for Nesta titled The Challenge of Co-Production that the time seems to have arrived for the idea that the users of public services are an immense hidden resource which can be used to transform services and to strengthen their neighbourhoods at the same time. The co-production critique suggests that the conscious or unconscious maintenance of service users as passive recipients is not just a waste of their skills and time, it's also the reason why systemic change doesn't happen. In 2012, Nesta and the New Economics Foundation published a co-production catalogue as part of the People Powered Health Programme. The catalogue brings together a range of case studies, resources and other information on co-production in health settings as well as in other sectors in the UK and internationally. The purpose of producing the catalogue was to enable practitioners to reflect on their own practice and the extent to which that represents co-production and to enable them to learn about co-production practice. Nesta followed this with a further report in 2013, examining how people's needs are better met when they're involved in an equal and reciprocal relationship with professionals and others declaring that this is the right time to take co-production into the mainstream so that it becomes the default model for public services. The legislative and policy context that's unique to both Scotland and Wales that emerged at the turn of the millennium with the establishment of both the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Senate has enabled the promotion of co-production as a way of improving public services directly with people being enabled to make the right decisions at the point where it matters. The Scottish Community Development Centre produced a guide focusing on the co-production by people and professionals of public services, stating that many of the best examples of community development are also good examples of co-production and that attention should be given to weaving community networks around individuals and organisations. The Scottish Co-Production Network was formed as an informal network in 2010, co-facilitated and chaired on a voluntary basis by the Scottish Community Development Centre 
and NHS Tayside with support from the New Economics Foundation. It came into being as a result of contact established between the New Economics Foundation and NHS Tayside as part of their work around the health equity strategy, Communities in Control. And through the Meeting the Shared Challenge program led by the Scottish Community Development Centre. From 2012, the Scottish Government has been contributing funding to support the Scottish Co-Production Network. In 2011, the early elements of what was to become the future Co-Production Network for Wales appeared. Some research and case studies, some events, some campaigning, and the start of a voluntary community of practice. As things developed, we visited our friends at the Scottish Co-Production Network to learn how we could establish a network here in Wales. We became a big lottery funded project between 2016 to 2019, which enabled us to formally set up the network and its infrastructure to support our community of practice, including people from across all sectors of public services, statutory, third sector and citizens, who all believe in the value of co-production. Now we're an independent not-for-profit organization supporting an ever-growing community of members. We're collectively working to transform public services and to still and spread understanding of co-production through meaningful conversations and through collectively influencing the policy context which enables us to do more and better co-production. Elsewhere in the UK there are strong co-production networks on local levels in England in Norwich and Oxfordshire, for example, as well as the co-production collective that emerged out of the co-production in health and research work at University College London, which now covers a broader remit. What's clear is that there is now an increasing focus on amplifying the voices of those who want to be heard, including those who are often ignored or excluded. The co-production networks across the UK are helping to ensure that people can be equal partners in the decisions that affect our lives. The story's not over and it's not going to be easy. We're just getting started. In the words of Edgar Khan, we have to fight for the things we care about in a new way. Thanks for watching. The Co-Production Network for Wales is a community of practitioners who learn, share and improve together. A range of resources and events are available to support you. Membership is free for individuals Organizational membership is also available for teams. Why not get in touch at hello at copronet.wales?